Hello, Ed. Hi, Doug. How you doing? I'm all right. Good. Nothing like waiting to the last minute, all of you. <laughs> like those mountain minutes always confuse me. <laughs> well, to since you guys have to be different than the rest of the world and change your clocks early. It's, uh... <laughs> so you have not undergone daylight savings time adjustment. Uh, we we do this on a regular basis. It's the last weekend in March and the last weekend in November. Very easy to note. So why did we do it early? What is this lack of coordination amongst the different time zones? I don't know. You need to turn up your volume a bit, Mark. I can hardly hear you. Let's see. Testing one, two, three, four. Testing. We're still very soft. At least for me. Uh, How does it sound to you, Doug? Yeah, just slightly better, but still not maximum level. Hmm. And how about now? Much that better. sounds much more normal. Well, that's what. That's more of what I'm used to. Is. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I had it set to automatically adjust microphone settings, but it had somehow gotten stuck at about 50%. And yes. yes. So unchecking that, let me uh, set it to maximum. You see, it's the human intervention that makes all the difference in technology. You can tell me what you want. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm I'm not looking forward to us being... You know, made obsolete. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a uh, it's a um, it's a vexing uh, situation that we're in. I think, uh, and you know, every day I read something new about. I have my Apple News app, of course, so uh -huh. they, they're feeding me uh, Elon Musk, and <laughs> it's some it's some kind of mix. It's either Elon Musk or Donald Trump. That's all I tend to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well it's hard it's hard to keep the two apart you know yeah, well, it's, it's either like you know apocalypse or transcendence there's, there's no pope there's no pope anymore i'm sure the pope should be there he should be but no, not on an apple feed i'm sure <laughs> <laughs> hi john greetings hello john hello mm -hmm. How We're are all you doing? doing well. How are you, John? I'm pretty good. How are you guys? Not the worst for wear. Yeah. Spring is really coming on here in Colorado. Last, oh, really? Yeah, the last few days have been quite beautiful. Cool, uh, but sunny. Uh, the days uh, are getting longer. That's spring in Colorado, huh? We got snow this morning. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I heard you have another uh, bomb cyclone coming. Oh, good. <laughs> yeah. It's been a, it's been a long winter of our discontent, but you know yeah. I kind of like winter. I think it's beautiful. Of course, I, I take cold showers every day, so I'm sort of yeah, yeah. fortified. <laughs> yeah, this this poetry poetry reading is really uh, kind of warming things up for me. I, I kind of mentioned the excessive overload of nonfiction, even though this is nonfiction or. Uh, academic type of work I, I enjoyed it was it was kind of light reading in a certain sense mm -hmm. it wasn't anything too heavy so i, I like that um, how did this come about what's the background behind this text i, I assume you'll go into this all ed but i'm well i i wasn't planning to go into much of anything but uh, jeffrey's here hi jeffrey how are you doing have we started are we going Hey, Jeffrey. Hey there. Hello. Lisa might have indicated that she was going to join us, but I'm not sure. I think she, I think she did, but she, she may. She did, as far as I, I am 
inferred from what she had said that she might that she might come. Yeah. Um, you know, the regulars always show up. That's true. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, this was partly you know, inspired by her because she she's the one who uh, gave me the, the she pointed it out to me. And um, you had mentioned it last time. I, I had, I had I, mentioned it last week. And she and since she since John Dotson was there. Yeah. And John knows Aaron very well, Aaron Cheek. And I know that Aaron's been working on a lot of translations of Gabe's work, like non-main work, besides the ever present origin. So it, 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 I thought that it was perhaps the case that he had already done it because it's one of those things, you know, he's not going to do it chronologically. And it's one of those shorter pieces that I think has a lot of oomph to it. So, you know, it, it wouldn't have surprised me if he had done it. And as it turns out, John said he had. So she was able to get a hold of it very quickly. Um, and that's how it showed up. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm, glad, I'm glad you mentioned it because I was unfamiliar with it until you mentioned it. And well, I didn't you, remember you right. saying it until I listened to the video again. I thought, oh, this uh -huh. is interesting. And then she emailed it to me and then I posted it and suggested right. it. And I'm glad because right. it's a very well-written article. I mean... Essay. Well, I, I, I think Gapeser writes very well in general. Yeah. Um, and I, I mentioned in the, in the, in the form, the, the German word for poet is uh, Dichter. And, and it's an interesting word, I think, because Dichten itself or comes from Dick, which means to thicken. So you can also have um, a Dichter im Wald. So there can be a place where there's a lot of trees that are kind of crowded in. So, so you get a lot of compactness and puts together. And anyone who, anyone who writes well, who uses language well, is considered a dichter in Germany. So um, there's a lot, there are a lot of people when they talk about um, Hegel, for example, they, they will talk about him as a dichter or, or Nietzsche. Now, they, they wrote poems. Nietzsche wrote poems. But that's not what qualifies him as being one, because you can write lyrical type poems and you would be called, considered a lyricist and not necessarily a dichter, though you probably would, because a lot of lyrical poems do move over. But anybody that has a very good command of language tends to, to fall into that. So the Germans always talk about their historical dichter and denker, their poets and their thinkers. Um, that's what they kind of they kind of. They kind of derive their reputation from but and it's so, and he would be considered one even if he weren't a person who wrote poetry per se be, just because of the way he uses language but another thing that i think is very interesting to note about about german is what determines germanness has nothing to do with ethnicity or nationality it is strictly defined by language so even the Swiss who speak a dialect of German that no normal human being can understand if you're not Swiss, it is German, therefore they are considered German. And so they, they're embraced in, in things that are, we'll say, Germanic. And the Austrians have their own dialect. It's very different. My wife can't stand it at all. She thinks they're, they're weird down that way. But they, they are considered part of the German whatever is German simply because they speak a variety of the language. You know, the only people that really take a hard line and separate themselves from, from us are the Dutch. They don't, they don't like to consider themselves <laughs> German at all, although there's really no difference between uh, Dutch and I would say East, the East Frisian dialect. It would be very, very difficult to tell them the difference. And they also have a line in their national anthem that says that, that, that they are descended from German blood, which they all kind of mutter over when they're singing. Um, <laughs> so it's an interesting thing, but, but I, I, the interesting fact remains that it is language that determines Germanness and nothing else. It's not where you live. It's not, it's not where you grew up. It's whether or not you, you relate to this, this, this German way of expressing yourself. So, that's why Gapeser would be a dichter even if he wasn't a poet. It's, he's, just, he's just exceedingly good with language. And, and the thing that I like very much about him, and I think it became evident in, 
in the grammatical mirror, if we can kind of seg into that, is, um, and it, it comes across a little bit in English, it doesn't get completely lost in translation, is that he actually tries to practice what he preaches. That was one of the things about the ever-present origin, is, you know, he said right at the very, very beginning, I want to, to give you an example of what it is that I'm talking about and these consciousness mutations. And so a lot of what he wrote, especially in parts two, I think are excellent is an excellent example of talking from the integral, not talking about the integral, which is kind of the point that, that got us all kicked off about this to begin with, because that's exactly what Lisa wanted to, to explore in more depth. And that's something that John has mentioned on more than one occasion, that, you know, it's one thing to talk about something, which is, a, you know, the philosophical approach, but actually getting into it and doing it is a whole other thing. And, and I think Apeser tries to do that in a lot of cases. So. Um, he doesn't use any examples from himself because the text that he wrote is an example of that. And he's, you know, we, we know from our reading of him, uh, for those who did and those who were trying to, uh, to do so after the fact, there are a lot of neologisms in, in Gapeser. He makes up a lot of words because he needs new words to describe things that he's talking about. And, and that's kind of like what we think about when we think about new language. We think about new words or concepts or, or, or yeah, lexical items in, in, in some way, shape, or form. But what he does is, is he takes German words and uses them differently than they normally would be used. He does infuse them with a different kind of meaning. And you find that in the, in the translation of the ever-present origin, especially where you come up with something like wears, you know, he, he wears something, and then there, it's in quotes because it's not W-E-A-R-S, it's W-A-R-E-S. And that comes, there is a German word for waren. That, and to war something is, is to perceive it on the one hand, but it is also to recognize it for what it is, because the word war in German means true. And Wahrheit is truth. So when he, when he uses that notion as a verb, which already exists, he's infusing it with, an, uh, uh, let's say, an added layer of meaning or a complexity of meaning that kind of stretches it out of its normal everyday, everyday relationship. And another thing that he uses a lot um, is he likes to hyphenate things together. That also came, that was the, there were a couple of places I noticed in Aaron's translation where, where he had in hyphen bezug in hyphen setzen, which means to set in relation to. And, and he hyphenates that phrase because he's actually highlighting the fact that there is an action going on. There's, there's something taking place here. I'm doing something that we normally don't think of in those, those particular terms, though we do that all the time. So you get a lot of hyphenated things that he has, which, which, and I admire Aaron for what he was able to do, is to be able to put that into a, an English that's still understandable, because he is using the language in, in, in ways that, that you otherwise wouldn't find. So um, I, I happen to think very highly of Gapeser, and I, th I think that this is one of my favorite, if not the favorite, non- EPO text that he's that he's ever written because it it gets to the heart of a subject that that I've always felt near and dear to which is language itself and what we do with language not necessarily whether it determines our thinking or otherwise um, I tend to think more in my in my older days that um, our, our thinking comes first and our our means to express it comes afterwards we try to find ways to say things that we're thinking um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes others un understand us and sometimes we don't, but that's, that's kind of the function of art, at least let's call it literary art. Anything that uses words in any, any way uh, tends to do. That's why some of us more easily follow some folks than others, I'd say, I think. So the opportunity to read it again and then perhaps, you know, just, you know, kick it around with uh, people who are interested in those kinds of things was, uh, I found a particularly fascinating exercise. Um, and then, because it's always something I've, I wanted to talk about to other people. I'm the only person I know that's ever read it. So, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know there are people who read it. So lonely. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's just like, well, oh, I'd really like to talk to somebody about this, but you know, I'd either have to sit down and translate it and give it to them. 
Um, and I've started on a translation a couple of times, but I've never got all the way through for whatever, whatever reasons. And so Aaron having one around that we, we you know, made it, had made available to us, I thought was an excellent, excellent way to do this. So now I don't, I don't feel as alone in the, <laughs> in the world because I do know that other people have read. I was doing a little bit of research yesterday because I found a couple of uh, German databases that I could search for. And, and there is a guy in Spain who, who wrote an article about it, but it's in Spanish. I don't do Spanish. So I, that cal- I go, well, okay, well, there are others out there. <laughs> but we haven't been able to find that common medium to get together and talk about it. So uh, that's, that's kind of how we got to where we are and what I think about this whole thing. Um, but the idea uh, ties in very much to what Lisa was saying the last time. And that's this, this whole thing about transparent language, diaphanous language, um, how do we talk from the integral, not necessarily about the integral? And so, um, you know, my my key interest, or as I tried to phrase, also the seed questions for our get together is, well, well, do you think do you think he's accomplishing that in some way? Do you think he's got a point? Do you think he's actually bringing something across? Uh, how well do you think he's doing it? Um, and so, I'm I'm actually. Uh, much more interested. I know what my reaction is to it, and I've kind of given you a feel for what that is, but I'm very interested in what you what you guys have to think about this and how you feel about what it is that you've just read. Oh. So that's my intro. That, that, that's a great invitation. Mm-hmm. Thank you very much. Um, can I start? I'll just jump right in, unless anybody else has a burning need to do that. Um, uh, I think the uh, mirror metaphor is, is quite interesting. That's what got my attention. And um, I'm just quoting him. He, the mirror remains always the mirror and the reflection always the reflection. Narcissus ever waits in the background and will find nothing other than the love for himself. Yet it depends on the love beyond us. I think that's a lovely uh, expression there. And on the fact that the I not only is reflective of the mirror, that's the acknowledgement, the response. Well, I'm, I'm missing the last part. I don't, I think I'm, I'm writing it. I, I read it down incorrectly, but um, I, I think that that mirror image is so powerful and it's in Buddhism, it's in Alice in Wonderland, you know, um, and the, the reflection in the mirror and uh, what our syntax um, how our syntax, our grammar shapes um, not just our, our, a sentence, but um, it mirrors our experience, some experience. And um, some, so many of our experiences are ineffable and hard to put into words because we, we have to put it into uh, this syntactical structure. And uh, I think poets... Uh, and, and writers and, 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 just, and ordinary people who may have had a really weird experience. <clears throat> um, they, we, we, you know, had these, um, this, this, this struggle with language. We have to wrestle with it um, to make it uh, a, 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 the useful tool that it can be rather than the enormous constraint that it also can be. And, uh, um, you know, I've, I've had to deal with this my whole life because I've intuited things that were way outside <laughs> normal range. <laughs> so that's why I identify so much with neuroatypical people. Um, I, I, was, I was very moved by this one description. I think it was um, the author of, um, that, you, that you know. Uh, what's her name? That you meant Jeffrey, uh, your friend? Erin Manning. She wrote a book on um, neuroatypical people, yeah. Yeah. and um, there's this wonderful her wonderful descriptions of, of, of people who are neuroatypical. And um, one description was a, a woman. She walks into a room and she says, "And if someone says, have a seat, she doesn't know what they're talking about because the room is moving all around." <laughs> <laughs> and it takes several minutes before the mo- the room becomes stable enough for any object to be uh, registered on her sensorium. 
So if she's standing there when someone has offered her a seat, uh, it's not because she's rude or not paying attention. It's because she's just organized in a radically different way. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, uh, and so, you know, a lot of people have to drop acid to have these kinds of experiences. <laughs> but there's some people walking around who don't need that. Mm. I was very moved by something um, the late uh, Terrence McKenna said. Uh, because he, you know, he did ayahuasca and drugs and he was into botanicals and um, he, he loved to do acid. And he said always when he would talk about his his trippy experiences, he would have individuals come up afterwards and say, you know what, I've had a lot of those experiences too, but I never, I don't need drugs, never. you know. And he said, well, he never, he said he did not believe them, but until enough of them had uh, you know, come up after his lectures and made this claim, he started to realize that there was, they were, this is probably a truth. And he said, these are very lucky people. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm one of these people. And mm. I do not consider myself that lucky. Uh -uh. Um, I have visions and out-of-body experiences and precognitive experiences, telepathy with animals. Um, these are not experiences that I uh, welcome. I don't want to, because most of the things that I'm alerted to are usually of a disastrous nature. Yeah. It's not like I get the winning lottery number. <laughs> I don't know. Nobody does, John. Yeah. I, I always get, oh, I feel like something terrible is going to happen to this person. And when it does happen, um, I get grief stricken because, oh man, shit, I, sh I knew this was going to happen. And why didn't I say anything? Or why didn't I intervene? And on a couple of times, and there had been times when I did intervene and actually saved somebody's life. So it's like, it's usually these, um, I, I think it's been reported by a wonderful writer um, who wrote The Secret Body, Jeffrey Kripal. He's written quite a bit on the paranormal. And he says that uh, these paranormal experiences often come out of traumatic episodes. So it's you get these synchronistic events and um, these flashes of like, oh, you know, turn left, don't turn right. <laughs> Those kind of uh, simple sort of commands that some, some aspect of your nature is, is attuned to. And I'm sure this is widespread in our, in our, um, in our uh, human condition because we probably would not have survived if we had to rationally assess uh, all of the options that we had. <laughs> we were in the woods or in the, in the forest and we knew uh, so there was a bear or a tiger around that corner. So, you know, go somewhere else. Um, and you, you just, you don't have a cognitive uh, awareness of it. You just get that tickle in the back of your neck. You know, the, you feel the hair raise and you know, oh, oh that, that, that's, the, that, that's the sign I need to pay attention to. So that's what I liked about reading this uh, is because uh, I think one of the questions that Lisa brought up was the harrowing kind of nature, the scariness of um, our conceptual grids when they get hardened um, and our need uh, to uh, sort of drop our concepts um, when we tap into these trans-conceptual kind of experiences and, and how do we form new concepts um, so that we can have a, a consensus reality that really works for people. Uh, this is, I, as you mentioned in our last uh, call, uh, Ed, that um, this is not a top-down uh, management decision. Um, these are very um, uh, in-the-moment kind of modeling episodes where you have to, you know, sort of find words really fast for things that don't make sense to you yet. Mm. And it can be vulnerable and not very, and very unpleasant, but it also can be uh, the opportunity for great poetry to happen. Mm -hmm. Of course, you know, poets like uh, mathematicians who deal with infinity sometimes have <laughs> go mad. They go insane. <laughs> go quite insane. Uh, or, or, or die young, you know, like, <laughs> like, like Keats. <clears throat> um, anyway, that's my spiel. So I just, I just love this article. Uh, I, um, I, and I've been working a lot with clean language, I think, and in, in this forum, I've had the opportunity to uh, share my enthusiasm for this method because it actually slows people down 
So they have to, uh, so they start to feel those gaps. And, and rather than fill it in with a, something that they are familiar with, they, they, they start to uh, go into metaphor. Because uh, I think that's, and, and sometimes when you ask a question, a clean question, and what was that sad boy before sad boy? It's like, no one has ever asked anyone that question before. <laughs> so it's sort of like, huh, could you repeat that? And then you start, pe you start to see people go into trance states, into very subtle left-right hemispheres start to shift. They're, and there's a different kind of tonality. And I think that my adventure would be in an, in an integral, uh, I, would, I would suspect that in the integral, when we're speaking from the integral rather than about the integral, we would be much more comfortable with with polyphasic consciousness. We would be very sensitive to the the cues that let you know a person's going into an altered state of consciousness, and it wouldn't be something you would have to interrupt and say, "Excuse me, could you pay attention? Stop mm -hmm. looking out that window. Look at the board. You know, mm -hmm. these are the kind of things that children, of course, we have to we have to train them to enter into a, this monophasic culture." But I think the uh, the downside of that is enormous, uh, because I think those magical and mythical capacities, especially when we're in this two D screen kind of world, uh, gets quite inhibited. And you know, it, it's an alarming how how quickly our social skills go down the toilet when we don't have this capacity, you know, to be very very sensitive to you know these um, non quantifiable. Uh, and non-measurable, but extremely intelligent capacities we have to make sense. So anyway, that's my spiel. Because you know, I I I uh, I found myself being quite lonely on many occasions. Because uh, you know, I just thought something that was obvious to me was just, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, other people just didn't get it. But then you know, sometimes uh, events corroborated an intuition that I had that I couldn't put into words. And I sort of went, oh, and it's a great liberation, I think, as we've all known. We, we, we read poetry, we read, see a play or see a movie or some great person put something into words that we always knew was true, but we had never been able to articulate it or we rejected it because it was just too weird. And when someone else does it, we go, wow, thank God, someone mm -hmm. said it. You know, I, I knew that all along, but I didn't, I thought I was crazy. Um, so I think if we were being coming from integral, we would be much more comfortable with feeling like we're crazy, and we would be much more tolerant of other people when they're when they feel vulnerable or uh, don't or haven't nailed it yet, as you say, Ed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when someone really nails it, you're great, you're grateful. But to nail something sometimes takes a whole lifetime, you know, of you know, slipping and falling and making no sense. So I love the I love watching the I love actually watching someone struggle struggle for the right word to me it's so beautiful it's so moving and when it comes that, that, it's like, that's my cue <laughs> <laughs> please please stop me interrupt me <laughs> yeah. so, so I'm going I, to I'm going to struggle with some words here um, but I do need to leave uh, in 15 minutes. Oh, yeah. um, but I, I didn't really get that he was writing from the a perspectival um, mentality. For the first forty something pages, he was pretty straightforward, and it was almost just a simple language and poetry analysis. And uh, I, I found a good example from Wallace Stevens, which is just. Mm -hmm four lines, which kind of sums up maybe all the separate divisions that he had uh, from the grammar to new use of adjectives to other parts of speech, such as and in the front of the sentence, uh, juxtaposition of yeah, the adjectives or colors with a um, abstract term type of thing. So I felt this is from Sunday morning which is 1923 when it was written, uh, which is about the time that he is saying these 
poems were kind of coming out of uh, into the modern era and into maybe hints of the the spiritual realm. Um, so it, I don't I know Wallace Stephen really I don't know if he taps into that spiritual realm, but he taps into that social or that imaginary realm. It's not necessarily highly, highly spiritual. Um, but maybe I just haven't grasped that in the readings from 10, 15 years ago that I did. And uh, upon rereading, I, I see there's quite a bit that I'm missing. But to do the surface level reading, just these four lines really kind of put the, the stick in the, the bike wheel, the stick in the spokes kind of makes you stop and realize this isn't just a surface reading and there's an, a world that he creates within these four lines that sets up the other however many lines it gets into but it starts off complacencies of the peignoir and late coffee and oranges in a sunny chair and the green freedom of a cockatoo upon a rug mingle to dissipate so it has the green freedom it has and at the beginning there um the use of complacencies that typically isn't going to be seen in plural form. It's normally complacency or complacent. And then of the penoir, like that, that kind of juxtaposes quite a bit there. Um, and the, the poem in general goes on to have themes of light and dark. Um, and then the next line reads, the holy hush of ancient sacrifice. So it kind of steps into another realm after it kind of startles you with these first four lines. Uh, but I, I really feel that, that that's exactly what the, the paper is getting at within the first 40 pages, at least, kind of the new use of language. And I, I feel Stevens and quite a few others from that era are really playing with the language um, and taking it into that, that realm that they wish to. Um, Can I ask you a question, Doug? You have that poem. I was, I've been thinking about that poem all morning and there's a line in it i think it's, it's tuesday morning though i know <laughs> I, <doesn't>. I, <laughs> I, know you're an, I know you're having an altered state so i'm going to be very tolerant of that <laughs> <laughs> uh, i'm death is the mother of beauty that's in that poem is it not a few stanzas down you know better than i would <laughs> yeah i have it right here in front of me <laughs> If, if, I, if I misquoted, I can't remember the rest of the line, but death is the mother of beauty. It's a very, um, it's, a, it's a, a metaphor, right? Would you like me to read it now? Yeah, if you have it there yeah. in front of you. And so it says, death is, the mother, mo bleh, death is the mother of beauty, mystical, within whose burning bosom we devise our earthly mothers waiting sleeplessly. Good, thank you. Um, and I think this is a, an excellent example because he talks about metaphor and simile and the difference uh, in, in the grammatical mirror. He's talking about the difference between metaphor and, and simile and how metaphor is a statement of identity. And a simile, of course, is a comparison using like and as and what the differences are. I think this is really interesting. Um, and, and death is the mother of beauty. It's interesting, um, that line really works. But listen to this line, death is the father of beauty. I think that doesn't work. And I think there's a reason why. And uh, I'm not a cognitive linguist, really, but there's a Mark Turner and Lakoff, I think, the, the one who wrote the book with Lakoff and Johnson that's so famous. Uh, they wrote a book on this, I think. Uh, and why death is the, is the mother of beauty works and why death is the father of beauty does not work has a lot to do with these um, image schemas, these unconscious um, but organizing templates 
Um, and it has something to do with kinship. I, I, I'd have to go look it up and read it again. But that whole idea of up and down and left and right and front and back, these are hardwired. And they do break down these templates or image schemas. Our image schemas emerge out of up, down, left, right, front, back. Um, but it does seem in mystical experiences and shamanic experiences, they br this template breaks down. And then we have the mystics throughout whatever tradition, they have a, once this has happened to them, and it, prob it usually scares people shitless, they have a very hard time putting it into words without using paradoxical language and using um, metaphor. And this, I think, is, and I think poets are very close to mystics in this way. Mm -hmm. Of course, uh, and I, anyway, and schizophrenics. <laughs> you know, there's a very fine line between a mystic and a schizophrenic. So, thank you, Doug. That was very inspirational. We must and, be on the same wavelength today. <laughs> well, thanks for that analysis there. And have you talked about the death is the father of beauty before recently in one of your past videos? Because I'm having extreme... Deja vu right now. It's possible okay. that something online I may have brought, I may have dropped it in because um, it it was, you know, I'm so obsessed with metaphor and mm -hmm. an analogy and simile and this kind of stuff that just keeps me up at night. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I, I'll wake up in the middle of the night and say, "Father is the death is the mother of beauty," and I'll be, you know, in the loop with this for a long time. But I think it is something that uh, Mark Turner has written a. Um, book on and that's prob and that's where I got it from but I haven't I haven't reviewed that in a long time and maybe after reading this essay I'll be inspired to go back and look at that because I think it's it's very interesting I mean we all have these templates we all have these image schemas but we we're usually totally unconscious of them except when we have these really odd weird experiences um, that I think poets really focus on in, in very intentional ways. I do have one question and I do need to go soon, but mm -hmm. I was kind of wondering as, as we take this kind of live, so going from the reading and going to this, this talk here, like what, I guess he touches on it at the end. And of course, maybe the ever present origin really explains it. And I haven't um, read the book just yet or grasped the entire concept. Um, but I'm just wondering the implications of kind of taking the poetic to the live face-to-face -face level as we're doing here, as opposed to being alone as we all <laughs> seem to be before this reading and reading a separate poem. Um, like within that space that we're provided here, there seems to be a different realm than what he talked about in the paper except for maybe the very final pages. So it's just well, a question. Um, if, okay. Go ahead, John. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, um, it's just that I was um, thinking, what, because, uh, John, you were mentioning image schemas. Um, I did quite a lot of work on image schemas and several publications on it. Wow. Um, but I also have a, a video on YouTube, which I'll give you the point or two, which sort of explains them and situates them in the context of um, creative design work. Um, Please do. In the context of dance. So um, um, I think it might complement what you were saying about uh, image schemas uh, in a way of understanding this idea of taking language and turning it into something that is... Um, more um, integrated into the everyday environment yes. or, you know, the, so this sort of mixing of poetry. Um, I did want to say in general about the Gebser text. Uh, this is my first time reading Gebser. Um, I'm not quite so enamored of the writing as Ed. Um, I'm, I, it's not that I dislike it, but I found it slightly resistant um, and it might be because it's translated from the German, the text itself. So mm -hmm. um, I, I found it a little bit difficult to 
grasp some of his concepts the way they were worded. And then I had to sort of go over reading it a couple of times in order to pick things up. So, um, compared to Slaughter Dyke? Well, Slaughter Dyke is yet yeah, a different <laughs> thing, but, but, um, <laughs> it's a different kind of writing, but, mm-hmm. but I did have some difficulties with the Gebser. Um, so, um, also, in terms of the article, it's one of the reasons I wanted to listen to you all first. Well, Marco, you haven't spoken mm-hmm. much. But, uh, um, I sort of read this and I sort of say, yeah. I mean, isn't this something that I've known for 50 years? <laughs> it doesn't feel particularly new to me. Um, so uh, I'm not sure... I, and I couldn't tell you exactly who I've read that gives the same kind of message, probably a, a collection of writers who've, who've worked around these issues. I mean, I was married to a, an award-winning poet, and she used to teach me about how poetry invents words, and, and, and we had lots of discussions about it. So it might have been partly that kind of context that led me to this idea that... Um, Poets invent language and change the way we think about things. And, you know, so there's a kind of general background there. Um, But I do remember reading a text. uh, And so I pulled up the text, um, an analysis of um, Gerard Manley Hopkins poetry. So this dates back to, this was writing at the beginning of the 20th century. And what's interesting about Hopkins' poetry and why it was, uh, the book that I was reading was about it, it was the fact that he he was at the transition between the more formal, structured, um, metric kind of writing and modern contemporary writing with free verse and, and this kind of approach. He uses the formal approach, but he but his use of language is follows the natural rhythms of English rather than the metric structures of language. And he breaks up his lines in a way that emphasizes the natural rhythms of, of English as a language, as opposed to, um, you know, this sort of the da, 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 da kind of thing. So for instance, this, the one that that's most well known of him and one of the ones that, was part of the of the work that I was reading is the one called God's Grandeur. So the world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. I'll just stop there. I just do. Uh, but you hear the you hear the internal rhymes inside the lines you don't hear the hear the, the breaks at the end of the lines you know you so you have this sort of um chop top structure to the and of course it it's gorgeous to listen to mm. in terms of the anyway so i i tend my my sort of understanding of language is very imbued with this kind of poetics of language and although I, I really I enjoyed the text on adjectives and how the, the shifting of adjectives, I didn't find it being particularly, again, I didn't find it particularly striking as, as a new way of thinking about this. It's sort of reinforced ideas I already have about it. And even the, the discussion of rhyming, again, modern versed, breaks up the rhyming structure of traditional poetry in ways that go beyond what Gebser is talking about here. Uh, and so in some ways, this is slightly antiquated in, in terms of an analysis of poetry because modern poetry has gone well beyond what's discussed here. And so again, English. I felt... Huh? English poetry. English poetry, yes, ex- exactly, indeed. So um, I don't know... I don't know my way around German poetry very much, but uh, yeah. So, um, 
but I mean, I'm open. I mean, and, and the other thing I don't understand quite is the argument about the integral, and that may be because I don't understand the integral, which I've mentioned mm-hmm. several times. But um, I mean, in terms of how language reflects a changing consciousness, I get that. But that the changing consciousness is a particular type that one calls the integral, I don't get that. I, I don't get. I don't get why the particular movement of the adjective that he's talking about means that it leads to a more integral focus on things, for instance, which is the way I understood the article. So, <laughs> so I would like help on understanding those kinds of questions. I guess. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good. Hi, Lisa. Uh, can we Hi. say hello, Lisa? Lisa? Hi, glad to see you. Could make it. Hi, Lisa. Yeah, sorry I'm late. I <clears throat> I had a client to talk to first. Yeah, got to do what you got to do. <laughs> <laughs> so Ed did a neat little introduction to the text. Uh, John shared his feedback and reflections. Um, Doug did as well. Jeffrey did. I haven't yet. Um, and we've been taking it easy, I think, and sort mm-hmm. of giving our, our, our just open-ended responses uh, at this point uh, to, to the text. And uh, I actually would, well, I would invite you <laughs> to, to, to participate before I do uh, because this text came through you. Uh, and you might be able to frame it or offer us some uh, um, you know, perspective that that leads the discussion in, in a way that's is going to be fruitful that I could kind of ride on I could pick up on uh, after you do because I'm not sure that I necessarily have that um, the so so when I sent it to you guys, that was the the first time I had read it as well. Um, And I've only read it once, but let me just give you some quick off the cuff. Um, At first I found it a little, you know, like he was kind of stretching things to make a point about the, the difference um, in kind of space-time relations. Um, I, I could see it being kind of analogous perspective was invented in, in things were just kind of like stacked on top of each other. And then with perspective, we, you know, we get the vanishing horizon point. Um, and he was just sort of saying, well, that kind of a switch in the way words were used happened in language as well to kind of, give us this this altered feeling of space time in in the way that um it's described poetically um i i think um you know that type of playing with language and and I don't think it relates just to you know the kind of the limited way that that um, he was describing it, but as uh, Jeffrey said, that you know modern poetry has has gone a long way to kind of play with language and stretch it. Um, uh, you know, Dylan Thomas. Um, kind of took took everybody else's um 
ways of playing with it and like dumped them all into one pot. And so, you know, he, he played and stretched and used, you know, used nouns where verbs should be and used verbs where nouns should be. And, you know, just kind of like tossed everything, um, all, all the old rules out the window. Um, there, I think I'll stop there with that article. Um, there, there was a, a new article that just came to me again um, from somebody else, and I haven't even like, maybe maybe I can put it put the link into the chat. Yeah, here we go. You guys might enjoy this as well. I'm going to do this. There's the chat. Um, so, so I'm going to stop there. Marco, do you want to pick it up? Is your I can't hear you. off? You can't hear you. Oh, hi there. Mark? Sorry about that. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I wanted to contextualize the text a little bit uh, in terms of maybe where it's coming in Gebser's trajectory and <laughs> maybe where that fits, where, where that moment fits historically in a larger cultural uh, process. We talked about modernity. Uh, and we're kind of here on the cusp of post-modernity. Uh, that is to say, in the 60s, when, when he's writing the foreword to this piece. And, uh, w having this conversation ourselves, we're in 2018, arguably, intellectually, at least, in some sort of post-modern post sort of phase shift. Uh, there's different ways of thinking about all, all of these things, but... I think that having, insofar as Gebser is referring to modern poetry and is situating his uh, analysis here in a particular uh, framing you know, for the history of literature, or poetry, or cultural history in general, I, I want to be explicit about what I think that that is. So this essay, and again, I'm not doing this as a scholar insofar as I have a lot of background research. I'm just looking at the facts on the, you know, in, in the text itself. So this is in 19, uh, he's writing the, the forward to this in 60, 1963, I believe. The text originally written in 1941 was going to be published by Thomas Mann and Dr. Emil Oprecht, uh, but that, those plans were disrupted by the war. So it was published a few years later. But really, this text is a... Is a um, an early version of a section in uh, the ever present origin, uh, which come which comes in 1949. So this is an early version, I think, of thoughts that are more fully elaborated, actually, in in um, ever present origin. And I think to understand the text, we have to understand his project at that level, as it's laid out in in this book, his sort of meta project. And then we could situate that within a larger cultural history of uh, these mutations of consciousness that, that Gebser talks about from archaic to magic to mythic to mental to integral. And the particular kinds of experiences or perceptions uh, which he you know, describes through various terms like a perspectival or the uh, concretization of the spiritual, in some of these language, you know, particular in innovations in language, you might say, or mutations in language that he introduces to try to describe or try to communicate or transmit the integral as integral or from, from integral. So um, I th on that, 
what I understand Gebser to be doing and what I understand him to be meaning by the integral is this post-mental. It's post-mental in time, but the way that he acts in the sense that it emerges from the historical perspective later than the mental, which emerges later than the mythic, which emerges later than the magic. But its character is also has something intrinsic to it having to do with the experience of time. Uh, and specifically, he is as asserting that the integral experience of time does not, it is one of an intensity rather than a spatial sense of time. So he goes through in, in this in ever-present origin, sort of it's divided into two parts. The first part is a um, elaborate, an explication or elaboration of these structures of consciousness that he discerns or he perceives in historical human culture. That was the archaic, magic, mythic, mental, and integral. But then in part two, which is where this essay would fit in, what he's looking at are what he calls manifestations of integral consciousness. And he's looking at different areas of human activity. So painting, um, the sciences, um, architecture, uh, and and poetry, literature and poetry. And so in that, in the book, the, 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 section, the section that this corresponds to, it would be page 488, actually, or excuse me, 487. Uh, in, let's see. In chapter nine, Manifestations of the A Perspectival World, the Arts, and this 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 book um, is before everything that came in the fifties, sixties, seventies. I mean, I think what we call modern poetry was superseded, in, at least stylistically, maybe not in terms of depth, but stylistically by postmodern, where really all bets are off. I mean, anything kind of goes in that a perspectival space. The difficulty is that like what, what a lot of people call postmodern, I think is very superficial compared to what Gebser is calling integral. So there's not, I think, an equation exactly between the postmodern and the integral. And, and some thinkers like, thinkers like Ken Wilber puts the postmodern in between the modern and the integral. So he sees integral after postmodern, whereas Gebser is writing before the idea of postmodern was even really a um, uh, currency. So he doesn't have that to go to as a sort of explosive step before the, the place where everything gets uh, destructured before it gets restructured. And, and what I think Gapser is talking about in the, gram, grammatic, gr, grammat, the, the grammatological mirror is this snapshot in time before the, de, the, the total destructuring where you're seeing these kind of shifts and it's, you know, these ways that uh, words are being fundamental and sort of unnoticed words, adjectives are being used differently. But it's really just the beginnings because that totally explodes in subsequent years. And now what I think we would really mean by the integral has to do less with that explosion or that, that um, uh, destructuration and more with a, a restructuration of, of um, forms that are adequate to a holistic uh, perception. And, and so that then speaking from the integral would be having those forms, inventing those forms, creating those forms. And that's really the, I think, uh, the challenge of contemporary poetics is uh, finding ways that are holistic to, holistic but presupposing the destruction of, of meaning that has already occurred in order to open up a new sort of vista or a new a uh, whole, a new relationship, you can say, to to the whole. Uh, so, th I think it was an in I think it's an interesting essay. I, I did I probably really felt about it somewhat similar to Jeffrey in that 
you know, it, it was good to read because it's good to read Gebs or his to follow along with his mind. Um, but I think we would need really need to update this. And if if we're looking at a grammatological mirror, we, we would need to um, really take into account a lot a lot of what's happened since you know the ninth, since nineteen sixties, uh, and really see what what is this mirror showing us now because i think it might be a little different than what it was showing to to gabe sir when he wrote this well. did, did you um see in uh, it was the um the video that uh john sent the the con langing video um yeah. oh. I I, I, you mean your talk i saw your talk is that the one you're talking? No, about? no. You you sent around. Uh, you sent me a video to look at of this guy who did um, this con langing. Um, anyhow, regardless of whether you watched it or not, uh, one of the interesting things that um, was both in the con langing film and in this video was that the con langers are um, using, they're, they're merging poetry and, so like one guy like drew a picture of a heron um, out of the, using the words of this poem about the heron. So the, the heron itself was both, you know, art and words simultaneously, which I think is a, another interesting, it, you talked about, Marco, the um, uh, finding yet a more modern um, form for poetry. And that's what, that's where my mind went, was to mm -hmm. these forms that combine um, both a visual artistic expression and words. Mm. I wanted to thank you, Marco, for um, that was brilliant to sort of situate Gebser and get an understanding of how it fits within a broader scheme. Um, very much what I was kind of looking for as a way in this text. You know, I'm not opposed to looking at texts that ha are interesting for historical reasons. Um, so I think situating it historically is useful in this way. I get there's something else going on here than just historical context, but it does help even to understand the broader message in the text to understand its historical context. So. Well, there's something just, I think, to relate to Lisa's point here around the play with form uh, and the, the explosion of that kind of experimentation with form that I think occurs in, in postmodern art in general, poetics, you know, certainly. Uh, and, 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 and that's that, this distinction between mental and integral. A lot of that play, a lot of that de deconstruction and experimentation can happen in a very mental way. It could be kind of rearranging things spatially switching around words, cut and paste. There are all these different techniques, right, that arise for, re for re rethinking how text gets structured because we get a constructivist type of perspective uh, on tech, uh, on language itself and on, and on, and on texts. And then we get the idea that the author or the subject is, is dead. Uh, and so we're not bound to these modern, rational, uh, perspectival forms uh, and, and um, I think so so but what I think is still interesting about Gebser is that when you actually read him and say if, like I, I don't think this text is a great example but the, the ever-present origin start beginning from the beginning of the book and reading through it going on the, the journey with him as he you know, through the structures which he goes to great pains, really, to, to delineate. 
uh, to be clear, what's what's mythic, what's magic, what are the subtle differences in the way that those are represented uh, artistically or in, or in other ways, he goes to ex- extreme pains to de- delineate the mental because he doesn't want it to be confused with with what he's attempting to elucidate in, in the integral. Uh, it's a much deeper, I think, and it's a much deeper experience to really go with Gebser into his experience of the integral because that's what gives this sort of depth dimension that I don't think you necessarily get or often do not get in what's popularly kind of called postmodern. So even though it sort of comes before it, postmodernism as a cultural movement, it, I think, is all anticipating an emergent uh, moment in culture that maybe hasn't even yet arrived, really. Very, very, very in smaller pockets only, I think. And, and that's where it, I think it's interesting because that's to me where we might be operating. We might be honing, I hope, our our attention or our, our like where we're coming from is 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 the integral now, uh, not necessarily somebody's map of it, not necessarily Gebser's or Wilbur's or anybody else's, but but that sense in which you know it's a flower, or it's an emergent uh, quality that. That's where I think that this can be part of an interesting com- conversation, I guess. And, and it, there's a continuity then between our reflections on language in the last call, our reflections on consciousness, on physics, uh, on time, etc. These all are facets, right, of, of the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Can, can, I, can, I, can I add something? Ed, were you going to say something? No, 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 John. You, right you look like you're ruminating on something over there. <laughs> well, I'm always looking like I'm ruminating. It doesn't mean I am. It just looks like it. Go ahead. I, I just wanted to quote something that I think may be relevant. Um, the History uh, in English Words by Owen Barfield. Um, I just came across this and it just struck me. It's something that uh, I think Gebser would have appreciated. He may have known Barfield, I think they were contemporaries, but he says, um, he's talking about language and and new ideas. When a new thing or a new idea comes into the consciousness of the community, it is described not by a new word, but by the name of the pre-existing object, which most closely resembles it. This is inevitable. We have to proceed from the known to the unknown in language as in life, but language lags behind life and words as they change more slowly than things or ideas. And he, he just mentions um, when railways first came in, their rolling stock consisted of a string of vehicles resembling the old horse coach, so exactly that it was said later that the ghost of a horse stalked in front of the engine. Although this is no longer the case, we still call these vehicles car- carriages or coaches, and we, we're con- going to continue to do so. To take another uh, more patent example, when a modern Englishman or American uses the very old Celtic word car, we all know what he means. Um, So I I just think that's fascinating um, because I'm thinking of something close to home like uh, same-sex marriage, um, which now we all sort of know what that means and sort of take it for granted. And um, the sodomy laws have been struck down uh, gay people can get married legally. Um, this wasn't true ten years ago, and I remember a little um, um, a little guy I knew. I guess he was about ten years old, and he. I remember this was we're talking about fifteen twenty years ago, and he was like self same sex marriage. Ooh, yuck! <laughs> you know? And and then but then his uncle. Uh, I think this is, wasn't legal yet, but his uncle married another man. And um, he hung out with his uncle and his his uncle's husband. And he was very fond of them. So he had an experience of, of this, uh, what this word was referring to, se- uh, same-sex marriage. And he, he sort of said, you know, well, I guess I can get used to this. And I think it. I think that's how 
but that but there was a time when uh, same sex was over here, marriage was over here, but now we have a blending, same sex marriage, and I think that's uh, that kind of we don't recognize that blend. It doesn't happen. Maybe it takes a generation or two, as as you know, um, something new, new ideas. We have to use old language for these new ideas. Uh, and it takes a while for it to sort of change our, our, our worlds, our social worlds. But I'm just thinking of, um, if you think of a metaphor like uh, Juliet is the sun, Romeo says about Juliet. So you, and you think about Juliet is the sun, we instinctively sort of know what this means, even though it's very complex. So you have the, the sun, um, which has qualities like warmth and radiance and, you know, beauty and, uh, and light. And then there's this, there's this woman, Juliet. And somehow, Juliet and these qualities, there's a sort of generic space that sort of allows these to blend. And I think this being aware of this, as many cognitive linguistics are studying metaphor and simile and different kind of uh, figures of speech. And we realize how these are not just fancy ways of using words, they're actually the way the mind works. Um, I think it's a, a, a great development. And I think it's gonna, if we start getting more aware of this stuff, I think we'll start being more mindful of how we um, make these kind of links. and. Um, and I'm also wondering, what does, is there a relationship between any of this and what we talked about last week with the Klein bottle? Because <laughs> so mm -hmm. I think there might be. But that's another metaphor, so I don't know. Well, so, it's anyway. interesting, Johnny, when you talk about same-sex marriage, because same-sex marriage is using existing words and pre putting them together in a new way. Exactly. But I also think about transgender and cisgender. Cisgender is a new word that's been introduced in relation to transgender. So again, it's a shifting of the language that sometimes involves reuse of existing word patterns, but sometimes involves generation of entirely new words. Right. Well, I remember when I was um, a teenager, it was like a uh, homosexual um, and then gay and then 10 years later, it was, it was queer. And then it was LGBTQ. <laughs> and I don't remember, not once, do I remember anyone forming a committee and deciding what we were going to call ourselves. Yeah. It never happened. So I'm very, I'm very fascinated by how that happens. Um, but like, uh, like Ed said last week, it's probably not some top-down management kind of is going to you know, because, you know, the top down, actually, I think they have done studies. I think it was Labob, the linguist who studied um, Queen Elizabeth and her speeches over like the long reign she's had 40, 50 years. And she does, her pronunciation has changed. Um, but it's, it's, but they, what they've discovered is it's the street, the street lingo goes up. It, the, the way the queen talks, does not filter down, <laughs> but but pronunciations that are, were used on the street have have slowly come into her language and her speech in her official speeches. So I think that's just uh, very fascinating. And now that we're living in um, with the internet and the, the these uh, these little screens, and we're being exposed to different kinds of vernaculars. Um, I, I would expect there would be a, 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 a tremendous acceleration in how we use different dialects. I mean, I'm a Southerner, and from the South, there's, I come from Alabama, my, all my family did, and then we moved to Texas, and there's differences in the Southern, um, in, in Alabama and Texas. And I sort of wanted to be an actor, and I knew I had to get rid of that Southern accent. Although it slips in once in a while if I, if I have a couple of beers, especially if I'm around Southerners. But I think that uh, there was this, they, they, um, there were some people, theorists in the media who said, well, TV will actually uh, stop regional speech 
regional dialects from happening. There'll be like a standard. And that has not happened. It does appear, though, that more people can speak a standard English, but that doesn't mean they gave up their accents that they used in their local uh, places. So I find that really fascinating, um, how the expectation uh, did not occur that uh, regionalisms started to, uh, would, would fade away because of the effects of TV. So um, I don't know that, so I'm just curious about it, the internet. It may mean that we'll just be a little more comfortable uh, with many different kinds of vernaculars. Um, and we may maintain our identities around a certain kind of accent that we use, but we also might know when we go into an interview or uh, another kind of setting that we, can, we need to drop that and um, adopt a, a more neutral kind of uh, standard kind of way of speaking. So I think that we do this already and intuitively, um, will probably um, make for um, much more, um, and if we can be very attentive to the metaphors and the and how um, they start to become part of our, our vernacular, I would just imagine that coming from integral would be, would be a sort of a, and the a capacity for handling the, the, the polyphasic and um, how people have it on the tip of their tongue and can't quite get there. I think just more tolerance about not pushing it into a form that's ready-made would be uh, a much more fluid uh, integration could occur. Much more sophisticated language games, I think, um, that won't slide and slip into a solipsism, which I think is, uh, I think that the dangers of, um, on, on, uh, not being able to integrate. Um, I think we get into frag more and more fragmentation and um, multiple personalities, a uh, multiple personality syndrome, um, rather th which can be dysfunctional. I, I believe we may be moving towards a, a healthy multiple personality. It will not be a syndrome, but that will be uh, adequate. We'll find the language that's adequate to give voice to all these multiple, um, the polyphasic, what they still call in therapy, uh, sub-personalities. I don't think they are sub-personalities in the sense that they're underneath an executive personality that holds them. I think it's much more of like other personalities um, that could be arranged in a mandala rather than in some sort of top-down um, suppressive kind of grid. Anyway, that's my hope. Mm -hmm. so one of the things that one might speculate is that because of the internet, there'd be a lot more mixing of languages. But again, it doesn't seem to happen that way. Um, although French has taken on a lot of English, English hasn't taken on a lot of French or, hmm. you know, other languages in the same way. So uh, anyway... I, I think that's a it's a good point, uh, Jeffrey, and I wanted to also pick up on something that, uh, that John had said. Um, it, it can never happen top down. I, I think the French have an academy. I know the Germans have a, a commission, the Duden commission, that, that tries to regulate language. And, and they've been around for 150 years, and, and for 150 years they've been an utter failure because People just do what they're going to do anyhow, and they don't really care whether the commission says something. Um, that might be what's enforced in school. Uh, you've noticed that the Queen's pronunciation has changed in the time that she's been there, but you can't tell that to a German English teacher who still thinks that everybody in England talks like the Queen. Um, <laughs> so they try to force that dialect on, and but the kids in school who are exposed to, to Hollywood productions you get a lot more American English running around. And for most German ears, it's a much softer and easier way to speak. They, they all think we talk with our mouths full of hot potatoes, but nonetheless, um, it's easier to let things kind of out that way. So, you know, my, my feeling has always been um, whoever uses a language is going to determine what happens with it. And it just so happens, and I think one of the reasons why English has the role that it has in the world 
is that from its very, you know, we have to remember that it started out, you know, English itself is a language, if we, if we want to call it, started in 450 AD. And it wasn't really English. It was a, a dialect, a, literally a dialect of German. It was the Angles and the Saxons and the dialect that they took over to the, the British Isles. That was English at the time. So when you listen to Old English, we don't understand it anymore. Most people uh, can't read um, Chaucer in Middle English. Um, they certainly don't understand it if it's being spoken. If you try to have anyone read Shakespeare as Shakespeare was originally written, not the redacted versions that we get today because people can't relate to them, we can see that it's changed very much. But what, what Barfield points out is, you know, we... We have always had in the English speaking world a, a great flexibility. We've taken, if we didn't have a word for something, we took somebody else's. It didn't bother us a bit. We just shoved it right in and moved right on. And so we're always accumulating, sucking in, changing. We'll change the pronunciation if it suits us to the group that we're working with. And so this versatility and this, this, this ability to literally restructure itself while it's moving along is one of the things that will make English probably the lingua franca of the internet, because it's also very easy, even in pigeons, to communicate in English. I, I don't know enough pigeon French to get by, but I know some pigeon French, but that's all it is. But you can get by in pigeon, pigeon English. It's amazing because anybody that tries to speak any kind of English usually gets understood by the English speaker that's listening to them. For some reason, they're just like, well, okay, well, that's all right. And then it moves from there. So, you know, I always think or I've always thought that, that we will decide one way or the other how, how it's going to manifest. And it's, it's, I think, interesting and worthwhile to talk about and discuss and look for opportunities. You know, this is something that Marco had said. Gapeser wrote what he wrote, you know, half a century ago or more, 60 years. You go back to the ever-present origin. Um, he's obscure enough that nobody's really ever taking him to heart and try to update what it is that he was talking about and see, well, where is that now? How does that, how does that shape up now? That's one of those, those things I thought, always thought would be an interesting research project, but I never got around to researching because I had to do other things in my life. But that's exactly the kind of thing where I find that he provides an interesting framework. And unfortunately, those of us who have read him kind of go back to the default, well, I know what he kind of means, and so we work from there, and ignore the fact that there are, I do offer someone like Jeff an apology, because you don't have that background, and one shouldn't make those kinds of assumptions. And so Marco's contextualizing this was, a, was, was, an, was an excellent, needed add-on uh, to the discussion to keep it, keep it rolling at all, because that's, you know, we all use the word integral, but I don't think we all mean the same thing when we use it which is also okay. But, and we are, I am, I, at least, and I'm sure that John is and Marco, and I'm going to assume it's with uh, Lisa and Jeffrey as well. We all assume that however you're using it is how you use it. And I'll have to listen to you use it for a while before I start getting a feel for what it is with, that you mean when you're using that. And you can only get that in conversations like this. Most people don't take the time because of their everyday conversations that they go on don't devote that kind of reflectivity to whatever it is that they just heard. They just think they understood what they understood and they'll move on because that's how, how life would work. And so, you know, it's very valuable to, to reflect on these kinds of things and think about them. Um, the part of, of Gapes's piece that I liked the most was just specifically his emphasis on the little words. It's the little things that count. It wasn't, it's not the big things. We're, you know, we, like I said, in English, we make things up as we go along. You know, we, we'll take different languages. We'll take Greek and Latin and put them together and come up with television. You know, it doesn't bother us a bit where we go to get what we need to say what we're going to say. And we'll throw it in there and move on as if it was the most natural thing in the world. Whereas, believe me, in Germany, it took them a long time to get off of Fernsprecher, distant speaker to telephone long time <laughs> so, because the commission just would not allow that. But it didn't bother the people on the street because that was the easier way to get across what you wanted to say. And so you, you go with that. So 
these are the kinds of things why I think going back and look at what happened historically is interesting because it provides us with that really down in the basement kind of look at where are we now. And we realize, and Marco highlighted that uh, greatly, there's a whole lot of water that's gone over the dam in the meantime, a whole lot of water, different kinds of water. And that's had an effect on what it is that we're doing as well. I think we're getting a lot more sensitive to language. Uh, and partly the internet is a catalyst for this. And maybe I mean that, maybe I need to qualify that uh, because part, part of it is the political sensitivity. Uh, so, you know, the, a microaggression was not a thing. A microaggression is a subtle linguistic offense that um, you know, presupposes historical nuances sometimes more of, of course nuances of things that are a lot more than nuances but uh that really requires uh, a lot more care and carefulness on the part of speakers uh in 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 some contexts especially than previously was the case and i mean part of i think what the internet does is accelerate that because you can get these very fast feedback loops where somebody says something that causes an emotional kind of up, you know, reaction and becomes a viral uh, phenomena, and you know, get this these outrage uh, explosions, and and that becomes, though, however, a, a, a way that, for better or worse, we become more sensitized to how we speak. And one of the things we've talked about is metaphor. Uh, and the, the ways in which the metaphors that we use creep into these discussions. The idea of a war on war on drugs, John has brought up, war on poverty, you know, war on that that notion that, that notion that we're always in a war, this perpetual warfare, is something that we could pay more attention to in our language, culturally, and kind of get out of that frame of mind. So that would be a, a really concrete place where from the perspective, from a meta perspective or a self-construct aware perspective, where we're paying attention to the constructs that we're using in framing our world and framing our behaviors in the world, uh, that that's I think an area that this kind of thinking or this kind of analysis could sort of assist with. Um, I mean, language was getting invented very fast. Like teenagers are making up words just to evade sensors on the chat platforms that they use you know they have to com they have to find ways to sext without it being uh caught things like that uh and so it's it's like there's a one of the, arguably i mean this is what zachary fetter argues in this paper that we're going to publish event at some point soon uh, um we're becoming more transparent because we find more and more to, to pick apart in the language that we speak, because that's really what we're so, you know, we're paying attention to. Uh, and, and we have, we have so much more uh, of quantitative, uh, I, I, I think. Um, so, I mean, updating Gebser or like what, what, I mean, what, what I would look for is if we were to pick up where Gebser really was leaving off, it would be where do we really detect? Where do we really find the, the, the places in our contemporary speech, our contemporary artifacts? Where do we find what we would call the integral? Uh, I don't even call it the integral myself anymore most of the time because it is so kind of politicized and misunderstood in a lot of ways. Uh, there are multiple streams of thought that you know, have articulated what, what, that, what that word means. Uh, so like I poetically, I, I'm trying to find white ways to say the integral without using that particular language. Um, that, that's where I struggle. So, 
uh, and and it ha- and it, it plays back into these the ways that you know that in contemporary terms we use metaphors or uh, um, simple things like the 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 eye you know the eye. What do I mean by that? What does that mean in a networked world? What does that mean if there I am I'm a different eye in this context than I am in the context with my family? Uh, the, the, we have many more shifting contexts, I guess, more complicated. Uh, I wanted to actually go go into something with Gebster, though, if this would be okay. And this is the one of the little things. And maybe this is an area, too, where, Lisa, you might have some point of view on, on this, or not point of view, some dimension of view. <laughs> um, and that's the, the... This is... I'm going to jump outside of the text here and refer to some Gebsarian type of language. But this is the notion of the prefixes that, that Gebser uses. Uh, because this, part of the point that he's making in this, in this essay is that this mutation in consciousness is a move from a, a third dimension to a fourth dimension. And in the fourth, the fourth dimension, he, he'll say, is not really another dimension because you shouldn't try to imagine it spatially the way that the three dimensions you would imagine as a point, a line, and, and a plane, or excuse me, a point, line, plane, you know, 3D yeah. cube. Uh, but the fourth he calls it an A-mention. So he'll, some, he'll use this in other places too. So whereas we get to the rational, the, the integral is sort of a-rational. Uh, in other integral systems that are hierarchical or developmental, we would say that there's a, a pre-stage uh, or state of, of, a, of a thing, a sort of baseline state and a post or a trans state. So we'll use pre, post, a, non, uh, and these, a lot, these prefixes will denote either like developmental sequences or uh, like changes in structure, right? So we, we would go from a, ra- a, 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 a mention to, or a rational to rational or pre-rational to rational to trans-rational. Uh, pre-moral would be before you have any moral sense. Moral, having some conventional moral sense, trans-moral or post-moral or amoral, where it's there but it is not uh, determinative for your, uh, your comportment. So I, I get, I mean, not deficient, efficient. I've tried to, I've, 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 I've tried to think of it in terms of proficient, where the adjective, the, the prefix really changes what you're trying to talk about. So anyway, I'm, I'm suggesting this is maybe something like uh, we could look at in Gebser because sometimes I feel that he'll kind of default to a prefix, which is kind of like provisional. Like when you talk about an A-mention, that's not that evocative of what you might mean by a trans a four-dimensional or five-dimensional or trans-dimensional type of experience. Um, is there room there for for rethinking some of some of some of these concepts? Is maybe my question. Um, possibly because our logic, we just have a two-value logic: true and false. Um, if if you have a four-value logic, like some of the the Indian logics, where you have um, uh, true, not false, um, false, not true, true and false, and neither true nor false. It's like his prefixes um, kind of try to get to that um, more... Um, full a fuller state of possibility so like the trans is the both and and the a is like the neither nor 
Did, does that resonate with you? I'm I'm just yeah. kind of making this up here. In your art in your article, Lisa, didn't you talk about there's the big circle, both and, and there is a circle within that which is either or, so either or was included in both and. Is that sort of what you're saying? Um, by, uh, by alternative logics or or something. Or something that's more care consistent. Um, well, we're in the same universe, but I'm not referring specifically to that. Um, I do see either or as being kind of a, a subset of both and. Right. Uh, what I'm saying is that. Um, you know, when, when we uh, assert something, you know, like if I assert, you know, the cup is in the table, um, you, we, it comes with an implicit value judgment of is that true or not? Um, so we can say the cup is on the table and, you know, if it's actually like on the arm of the couch over here, then that comes back as false. Um, if we say something like the, the present king of France is bald, to use a common philosophical thing that they argue about, um, you, you'd have to say, well, you know, it's neither true nor false because there is no present king of France. So, so involved. Um, uh, but our, our logical system is, you know, we, we, we get kind of twisted around with both and and neither nor because it's not, it's not a really common part of, of our way of logical thinking. And I think, Gabe, sir, because, um, you know, the integral in the way that I see it is something that includes everything. It, it, by including everything, you have to include the neither nor as well. You have to in, include the, the, the not of the everything, which is not, a, you know, I'm getting kind of twisted with my words now. Does, well, does that of, make sense? No, I it, think that's it, a good sign. <laughs> it, it is a good sign on the one hand, but um, just to take that a step further, Lisa, he makes he goes to great lengths to point out that the a prefix that he uses is not the alpha negativo. He's not negating what's there. It's the it's the alpha privativum, which is it's freeing from. That that's the inclusiveness that you're that you're directly pointing to. It's got to it's got to be. Well, all of that. It's not this or that. It's not this, not that. It's it's right. actually not bound by any of that. It, it's that, but it's everything that 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 goes along with that, so to speak. And so this 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 a because we tend to think the, the the word I think that we probably have used most in our lives has been amoral, and we have always somewhere in the back of our mind said, well, that's immoral, and it's not at all. That has nothing to do with immoral in that sense. To be free of morals is different than having a negation of a moral, which was the, is the immoral. That's why he, a lot of times he goes, well, when I say this, you know, the eighth perspectival, I'm not talking about the unperspectival. You know, Marco right. is absolutely correct. He, he spends a lot of time dealing with prefixes that we use because they've come to mean certain things, but we're not always consciously aware of what it is that they mean, you know. So this idea that trans is inclusive, and the A is not exclusive, you know, it's actually encompassing rather than exclusive. That, that's why in your four value logic, he's, he's saying, well, okay, I don't think we have a set number of categories that we're dealing with here. That's, that's kind of how I understand what he's saying when he's saying that. And that makes him difficult to understand in a lot of places because, well, I, well, I don't normally think that, like that every day, especially when I'm at the stove cooking, for example. Yeah. Well, well, I could probably use it sometimes, you know. So um, that, that's, that's, it's a, I think, an important aspect of what he's doing. 
and and thinking about that can help us think about well how do we use them when we mm -hmm. when we do that but then again you know in, kind of in his defense german is a language of prefixes we have a lot of root words and depending on what prefix you throw in the front it means something different so you can have things like well Waren, we, we talked about at the beginning, which can be true or to be perceived, and Bewaren is to keep. But um, you could throw another prefix on the front. I don't think I can't think of a word right off the, the top of my head. And it would give that Waren, that perception thing, a whole different feeling or movement. And so, and it can be very subtle too. There's a difference between um, um, Verstören and Zerstören, whether it's a, just a fair on the front or a Zer on the front, because the one is destructive or taking apart, and the other one is kind of pushing it to the end that it falls apart. So there's, you know, there's a different way of falling apart that, that mm -hmm. comes across in that. And, the, and so that's why there's not, there's not a whole lot of words in German. I was always convinced that you could learn 200 root words in German if you knew the right prefixes, you could get by forever, you know. Um, because it, it lends itself to that. And he does do that a lot in his text as well, which makes it difficult for the translator at any rate, uh, I can assure you, but uh, the point's well taken. I'm, this is sort of weird. Um, I, now I'm all tongue-tied. Like, <laughs> remember, remember there's a, I think it was Gregor Bateson talked about that joke about the conscious and the unconscious and uh, sort of like when you ask the um, caterpillar how she walks with so many legs, and as soon as she considers that question, she trips and falls into the ditch. <laughs> <laughs> I think that, um, you know, that's fascinating, that, that conscious unconscious um, boundary um, and how fluid it is, because the unconscious is not unconscious. It's the conscious that is unconscious of the, And so it's, you know, I think it was George Miller, the cognitive said that, that we can hold five plus minus two bits of information, which is which about is the size of a, a seven, phone number. Seven plus that, minus two. Seven plus yeah, two. But actually that's not true. There are a lot of, there are a lot of people can hold much more information than that. Um, but I think it's, you know, the language games that we, we play um, where we have to like parse everything and, put it in past, present, future, you know, our tenses. And um, I, I think that um, there's a subjective aspect. I think I'm drawing on Rosen here, how um, if you're talking about a fourth dimension, which I hope we will, maybe this will be a future topic. Uh, what, 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 what do we mean by that? I actually think the, we're, we're drawing upon the fourth dimension all the time. We're just not paying attention to that. Because uh, we all have these maps, and um, they're sometimes very extremely u unique to each of us. And um, we don't know, they're not located in any one place, but probably distributed, um, and probably distributed among different persons as well. Like our memory is not just, it's not me inside my head, it's usually the people that I know and hang out with and converse with. We're going to uh, remember certain things and forget other things. So, and it dep depending upon what we're interested in. So I think that there's that fourth dimension, which is pretty invisible. That's uh, the background um, that can come forth to the, um, you know, like a, the gestalt switch, uh, like those Necker cubes. Um, but I think the, um, that fourth dimension is probably that real deep subjective um, stuff that we can't put into words right away. And it may take sometimes several generations before we can put these very subjective thought fields into some kind of formulation that can make an impact. Um, but, but when we do, it's sometimes, like I think of the, the, the 500 year old uh, institution of slavery in this country. It was an international um, s system and, and it, um, as I understand it, it sort of collapsed within four years during the, the, the American Civil War. Um, so we can, it, you know, and I'm hoping that capitalism will be sort of like that too, that we can move more, hopefully more towards something a little more just and more sane than the, the economic system we have now. 
we need to use our imagination, so we're going to have to probably come up with a lot of better theories than we have now. But I think we can start creating the conditions where that's a possibility. Uh, and it may change very quickly. Um, so anyway, that's my, my two cents. But I think that these, this, uh, what we can make actual out of all these possibilities is um, really um, not something that we can control but we do have a huge influence over it, just by paying attention to how we're paying attention, especially to our language. So, and I just wanted to share a little anecdote because I'm in this, um, I, I, I have, I've been reading Rudolf Steiner a lot and doing some of his uh, exercises, which are wonderful training for the imagination. Um, but I started uh, programming myself to, the next time I have an, uh, um, a lucid dream to ask a question, which I've often done, uh, like I ask the awareness behind the dream, a question. So last night, I, I've been working on this. I had to formulate the question, so the next time I get lucid, I'll remember what my question was, because sometimes you get so excited because you're in a lucid dream, you forget what anything. But uh, I had this, I'm posing a clean question. Um, does God have a size or a shape? And my initially, I got kind of frightened by asking that question because I think, well, that's kind of blasphemous. <laughs> I don't know much about theology, but I know enough to know there's been a lot of wars fought around this this question. But I, last night, I fortunately uh, entered into a lucid phase, and I was in this dream space, and I like, wait a minute, I'm lucid. I'm, I'm having a dream. Now, what was that question? Oh, yeah. Does God have a size or a shape? And everything just disappeared except for a hand. And a hand was floating right in front of my. And the voice said, yes, God does have a size or a shape and a shape. God is very small and in the center of the earth. And I just sort of, well, is there, is there anything else? But then I realized, but this is so absurd. And then I woke up because I realized this other that's creating this image of the hand along with this verbal uh, statement, I did not recognize this as, as my ego, but there's something fluid here. And I know that this intelligence that I think produced this hand and made this statement, which is not my ego, I don't know how to do that, um, is, much, is much smarter than my ego and is probably going to present something that I can handle. Um, that's going to sort of be operational for me at my current stage of development. But I'm already starting to doubt whether that's what, – what does my question presuppose is sort of now my, 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 um, my kind of curiosity. Um, and then I have this – I can start taking notes. And, you know, every night when I'm lucid, I can add another question and probably get another response. But I think this comes from a depth dimension um, that is much deeper and vaster. But uh, I sometimes am disappointed because I think, well, gee, you know, I wish they could, like, give me something more interesting than that. <laughs> but I think that it's probably just as interesting as it needs to be for me to follow, you know. So anyway, I hope that that probably sounds kind of crazy. But I think we're moving from modern, postmodern, integral. Gebser did not have that vocabulary. He did not have postmodern. But I wonder what efficient integral, what efficient integral considers modern and postmodern. Um, I I wonder if these, and I'm wondering right now if there is such a thing as modern. I, I believe I'm reading this uh, book, The Myth of Disenchantment. This author believes that modern it, it is a myth, and that postmodern would be a myth as well. Um, but that uh, the, the mythic has not been eliminated by the modern or the postmodern. And there's going to be a future with lots of myths. Myths are not going to go away. So I just hope that uh, 
these presuppositions that we've all been brought up to believe in and that we, you know, that we're enculturated to give credence to may not exist at all. It's just like it's something we made up <laughs> you know, called modernism, called postmodernism. And there may be some day where people look back and think, what, what were those fools thinking of? <laughs> I think Bruno Latour has already written about this. We've never been modern. <clears throat> so anyway, that's, that's my two cents. Uh, uh, John, you're going to like my book, Plenum, when you get to it. So uh, the, first you did... chapter, the first chapter is called, How Big is God? Oh, I love <laughs> it. I love it. <laughs> it's exactly along those kinds of questions that nobody wants to ask. ask, ask. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Well, I'm a little fed up with the prefixes, I have to say, like the post, <laughs> trans, meta, uh, <laughs> sub, not. Who, who cares? <laughs> I, really? Yeah. It can be such a vanity game. I'm integral and you're not. You know, well, that's what happened in most of the post, integral circles. I was already post integral, trans integral, meta integral. Uh, like, you know, we haven't even figured out integral yet. <laughs> and, or have we? I don't know. I mean, the, the thing is, if you had, I don't think you'd be talking about trans or post integral. Mm -hmm. Saying it in a different way that I'd actually get the first time. I wouldn't have to get integral and then get what's post integral <laughs> to get it. <laughs> Right. That's that, that's a very modern notion that there's a before, a during, and an after. That's a very – but I think there may be alternate – there may be alter modern movements. Alter and I think we have evidence of that, and I think that's a very interesting way of thinking about it. Like in art history, they're talking about uh, there were uh, alternate modernisms. Like in Africa, there were African artists who were painting – who were not allowed in the European academies, but they were creating uh, art that looked very much like French Impressionism, except that the content was different. You had black women instead of white women, but they they were they were painted in a in a, an Impressionist style. So I think, and in, in the they're talking about this as an alternate or mm -hmm. ultra modern movement, mm -hmm. and there may be an ultra integral, I would think. Um, especially in our integral age, that I don't know that um, Gebser, as uh, advanced as he was, could possibly have predicted what that would be like. But that may be maybe our burden or maybe our opportunity to sort of uh, put some flesh on that possibility. Maybe so I had a dream this morning. It wasn't quite a lucid one. But when I woke up, the the awareness that was with me was that um, was was kind of a, a metaphoric comparison. So my computer, when it's not hooked up to the internet, can do, you know, some cool things. It, it can store things and retrieve them, and it can perform a bunch of functions, and, you know, I've got some programs loaded onto it. Um, but when I hook it up to the internet... So much more is possible. And this, this dream image was telling me that I'm the same way. That, you know, when I think of myself as just, you know, this, this body, you know, I can remember some things, I can store some things, I can process some, you know, two plus two is four, what is the capital of Argentina, you know. <laughs> But if I hook myself and there was something about, you know, like the, the turning on of the, the, the getting onto the internet was like, like there was a ritual involved of connecting myself to, um, you know, the, the depth dimension, shall we call it that, if if I could do that in a way that, you know, wasn't just sort of sporadic here and there, like my computer connected to the internet and me connected to the depth dimension would be capable of so much more. And it's kind of a really simple, like, duh kind of image. <laughs> <laughs> 
but I, I'm going to have to try it. I'm going to have to, you know, very consciously try to be connected to source um, and, and not lose it. You know, like I, I hate it when I lose my internet connection, when I'm in the middle of doing something, you know, important. Why, why should I be any less rigorous with myself and let myself lose my connection to um, source just, you know, because somebody said something that got me angry. So it's kind of mixing the iceberg and the, and the Klein bottle. So it's the Klein <laughs> bottle, but most of it is hidden. Mm-hmm. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I think it's in that fourth dimension, that real subjective sense where the, the blending between the I, the personal pronoun I, and everything else, the non-I, gets very, gets very fluid, very fuzzy. Um, but when we come um, into, you know, this past, present, future language grid, a lot of that gets deleted um, because we just can't put it into words. So I think it's a, a challenge, as many of us feel called upon, to liberate the subtle realms, um, for us to take the capacity for perspective and bring that into the dream space, um, which, you know, I think this Gebser does help us because the, the, the mythic and the, and the magical um, didn't have that perspectival capacity that, that uh, came very you know, common in the modern. So I think if we can bring that in, I think this is, I, I just recently saw David Cronenberg's movie on, on uh, Freud and Jung. And um, the, the controversy between Jung and Freud was very interesting. But I think they were dealing with this in very direct, this, this clash between the modern and the, and the magical. And um, this is the, the whole big controversy between Freud and, and Jung was all about. And um, because Freud was very frightened by the, the telepathic. And not that he didn't have telepathic and um, paranormal experiences, because he did. But he also knew that psychoanalysis was so, uh, had so many enemies that that would totally uh, give fodder to the, the enemies of psychoanalysis. And, and Jung said, no, we got to be honest about this because this is really crucial. We have to deal with this paranormal stuff. We can't sweep it under the rug. So I found that um, very compelling. And I think that, um, I think we're in the, I, I, I think we're still in the, the midst of this, this, this struggle. Uh, between I know, what I accurately think Gebsu was calling the deficient mental. Um, but I'm hoping we're, I'm hoping for that Goethean science kind of, I'm, re, I'm reading up on the German idealists and, and Goethe and his participatory kind of um, models for science and, and working with um, the invisible actually, as he looked at botany and he looked at a, a flower and how it, how it, how it changed from the seeds to the full plant. And then it started to um, decompose how you can't, that's not, in, that's not an empirical investigation. Uh, that's something that you have to put together um, over time. Now we have, uh, we can look at plants with, you know, photography and film, we can see this happen. But back in Goethe's day, you had to use your imagination to do that. And I, and I think he, he uh, was doing this way ahead of his, his time and perhaps our time. But I think this capacity to use our imaginations uh, in, a, in a way that facilitates this uh, fourth dimensional unfolding, these invisible ranges of our experience influence us. Um, but it could, it could become much more uh, 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 relational and, uh, and full of appreciation and wonder rather than that Freudian kind of fear-based, let's, let's uh, stay on top of this and let's keep it down there. <laughs>
you know, this sort of hydraulics metaphor that he used. So I'm, I'm hoping that we can, rather than it being pushed down there and swept under the rug, we can bring it up and it can, you know, the conscious and the unconscious can enter into a, a, a relational um, fluid, limniscate, um, torus, something more uh, topologically interesting than this uh, hydraulics metaphor. Come back to Marco's comment about prefixes. Um, I think if we applied a poetic lens, it might cut through some of the crap. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And that's an interesting metaphor. What kind of crap is that crap? <laughs> does, that, does that crap have a size or a shape? <laughs> Where does poetry. that crap come from? <laughs> you, can still, you can still put prefixes into poetry, but you can't put them in any old how. Yeah. You know, you have a, there's a kind of an edge to it. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't go, you know? So There are standards. Well, there are aesthetic standards. I mean, it has to work, po it has to feel good. Uh, yeah, and, exactly. and something about the abuse of, of prefixes and compound words and so forth. Uh, Sloterdijk is guilty of this. Uh, Heidegger was terrible. Uh, I mean, really, it seems to be a symptom of Germanic philosophy, <laughs> honestly. Um, <laughs> I told you, they're loaded with them to start with. They just keep adding to it. It, you gets, know? it does get... It does get it gets tiresome, doesn't it? I mean, don't you want a, a refresh, uh, some a fresher way of expressing the same yeah. things, a more succinct way of expressing the same things? I couldn't agree with you more, Markham. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I couldn't agree with you more. Ed, why don't you wrap us up today? Uh, well, I thought we could just uh, run around and everybody could uh, do their last spiel before we uh, we get out of here. Um, we all had a. I, I thought this was a very interesting discussion this evening. Uh, simply because it not only did it shed a lot of what, on what Gapeser was saying, but it shed more light on things that have happened since then. So, um, and I think that's the real important uh, uh, takeaway, at least for me, from all of this, is that we can see that there's, you know, I always look at, at what I read as a seed for thinking about other things, and that's been able to happen now because um, of the fertilizations that have and cross fertilizations that have come on by everyone, you know, chiming in with their, their own view of what's going on. And I consciously use, avoid the word perspective because nothing that anyone has said tonight have I seen in a perspectival sense, in the sense that it's like this and not like that, rather than, well, this is a way and there's a way and here's a way and we could do that as well. So a lot of that, so vol us all, this and that in addition to. So that, that was the, the real plus for me this evening. But that's just me and I was kind of like everyone's feedback on what they got out of this and we're probably good to go. Well, I, I'd like to, instead of looking backwards, I'd like to look forwards and um, uh, one thing that I got reminded of during our conversation today is um, something I used to do what year is this? About 10 years ago, I used to go around to a lot of rotary clubs and whoever I could talk to, whoever I could get myself in front of, I would do this little talk on creating language for peace. And I would go through, you know, the Lake Off and Johnson metaphorical basis and how, you know, our language is just saturated with war metaphors. Um, and one of my favorite examples is the conscious adaptation of war metaphors in weather forecasting. Um, you know, before when we were using the farmer's almanac, we didn't have the, the notions of like cold front and hot, you know, warm front. And those come directly from fronts in war games. And I thought, well, you know, how can we, and I was, the, the point of my talk was to encourage people to make up new metaphors. And so I tried to make up some new metaphors to um, help them along. And I said, well, you know, what if we switch the metaphor from whether is like war to uh, whether's like sex? And, 
you know, we could say, well, <clears throat> um, the warm air is just barely flirting with, you know, the cold air, so the chance of precipitation will be low today. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Why not? Yeah. So I'd encourage you to, you know, like make up new metaphors. Right now we're having more than just flirtation. We're having all that consummation of warm and hot. <laughs> <laughs> it's dripping here. <laughs> Is it really? It's hot. It's cold no. here. It's Oh. Well, yeah. we're we're getting some much needed rain is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it's been snowing here. I'm fascinated by the I, the personal pronoun I. He, he, he has a sentence here, which I copied down. The I withdraws from its dominant place for the first time in the structure of the sentence. I don't know what he means exactly by that, but I know um, in our last session, we talked about a sound that Lisa made when we were doing that clean language session, that mm, mm. Mm, you got it. It's come back a few times since then. Oh, okay. So there's something I think, um, and then and then it got embodied and became a the I an I, personal pronoun I. And is there what kind of I is that I once it's it, it's located somewhere in the chest and the throat? I think that's. Um, I think that I that personal pound on I. This is a project that I have that I'm thinking in some future session. I would like to um, invite us all to participate in an exploration of that pronoun. Um, because I think there's a whole lot going on there. That it, it's much more than just a, the the I as a as a linguistic uh, device. Um, and I also so that's a future oriented thing, and. Um, I think um, that, that's, that this conversation was just extremely stimulating because I read a lot of theories and I gloss over some and some I really study, but I think there's such value in getting together with, uh, with people who are competent and who are informed in ways that, in, in many ways, in areas that maybe I'm, you know, really not so confident at like logic or semantics. Um, but I, and I think it's just um, great to be able to have a space so you could put stuff into words um, so that then it becomes integrated and becomes, um, you know, it becomes, you get a felt sense for it. Um, so I think the cognitive and the somatic start to um, become uh, in, in better rapport. And I think that generates outward into, in, into the group. So this was a, a great, another great session. Thank you all. So I have as many questions as I had coming in, going out. <laughs> um, most of my guest questions, uh, I, I mean, I'm not saying I, I haven't changed perspective, maybe a little bit through the discussion, but I'm really interested in this problem of how to modify the language that we write with in a way that makes it more, if you want to say integral, I don't know, or poetic or, or imbued with the values and the kinds of thinking that we want to make it. So I do different things in my writing that I try to bring some of these elements in, but, um, I don't have any final answers on any of them, you know, because they're not necessary. Often they're not, they're quite challenging to do. So uh, I, I remember reading years ago that Frank Herbert, when he wrote Dune or in much of his writing, he would write a poem like a haiku or a poem, and then he would build out his chapter from the haiku. Yeah. And so that's why a lot of his writing has this very sort of... <laughs> in this, you know, sort of non-quite verbal kind of character to it because it's built out of poetry. I've always admired that kind of approach, but it's not easy to put into practice. So, um, so 
those are the kinds of things that I'm interested in. And, and certainly I'll think more about what Gebser wrote about and maybe how to update the Gebserian approach, as we were saying, for more modern practices. Marco, you're on mute. Sorry. Uh, well, my, my, uh, uh, I, I, uh, I haven't, you know, it's funny, I hadn't read Gebser's almost since our reading group, which was a couple of years almost. Uh, and when we did that group, we read through the whole of Ever Present Origin, uh, and I read all of it except for one section. I, I got too busy that week or something, and I didn't finish the pages on literature. <laughs> <laughs> which is your field okay so the cosmic plan was to do this so that you would finally get around to taking a look at what you skipped before <laughs> one could read it that way i, I suppose uh so it, it got me to go back uh and look at that section again um and and, and it also i think got me to um to more deeply consider the ways in which, uh, let me put this. What what do we want the lang the language to do? That's what I, that's what I started to think about because there there are a couple places here where Gibbs sort of lays his cards on the table, and, and I think those have to do with where he talks about the spiritual light and the way that integral language brings things together in that spiritual light. Uh, and, and, and it has to do also with the way in which meaning is not unidirectional. It sprays outwards is kind of how he put it with the adjectives. Uh, and, and so th th those things, whatever the terminology is, adjectivi adjectivially or grammatologically, uh, there's some effect to integral language and it has to do, I think, with this perception of, or trans, as Gabeser would say, transparency to, or translucency, uh, transparency to the spiritual light or translucency. Uh, and, and so uh, that's the reminder that I'm going to take. That's what I'm more going to practice with is when, when does language uh, let that occur? When does language really let that happen? Let that, that perception Per, that view, that experience happen. Uh, whatever the words are, it, it could be really, a, what I, it doesn't have to be technical. It, it could be elephant. Uh, it, it could be uh, the black coolness of the night. Or These are just examples, but the, what really happens in the poetic moment is that they all unite in an experience. And so that experience, I think, is what this essay is ultimately pointing us toward and uh you know once again our conversation helped to bring that to light so i appreciate uh, all of our being here and uh, our participation and presence and transmission thank you thank you marco and just um about next week are we meeting next week or i wanted to personally take a week off okay but you can, if you want and to. Then, if something comes up, you can. Uh, and I might show up anyway. Uh, but I, I kind of wanted, when I, at the beginning of the year, I mapped out 12 or 13 up until the equinox. And I thought that might be a sort of moment to take a breath, look back, see where we've come in you know, this season, and pr think about what happens next. Uh, so, uh, to the extent that that can happen in the, the forum or if it needs a conversation or what, what really wants to happen there, I'm, I would like to, you know, as we're transitioning from one season to another, uh, to think about, well, what's the next season for, for the, this conversation? Where, where does this conversation want to go? Uh, and I did want to reserve the following week for a sort of big picture organizational, like what's Cosmos doing? Mm -hmm. There's this like, really 
there's been many different streams of conversation. I've talked individually with people. People have talked amongst themselves. There have been different channels, groups, etc. But if we could occasionally try to str- try to bring those strands together into a common this, you know, a co- um, space or a common dialogue, uh, I think that would be a useful thing. But then with respect to this Cosmos Cafe, uh, you know, we've done a number of these now. We have many hours and it'd be uh, good to, I think, see, all right, where does, where, does, where, where, where does this go? We know we have Aurobindo coming up. Uh, there have been topics on Taylor de Chardin, metamodernism, poetry, writing, etc. cetera. Uh, so I have some thoughts on, on all that, but, but maybe we could bring those out in, in future, you know, in, over the course of the next couple of weeks. That would that'd be great. Um, I'm just thinking that um, if, if, we, if we're in between and don't have anything, we could always go to, back to this um, because we did one chapter. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey, you, Ed, and I think Doug were there. Mm-hmm. I don't know if, you've, if you know this, Lisa. It's a great book, uh, Ir- Irreducible Mind. But I was just thumbing through here, and I've read some of these chapters, but the one on genius looks is very interesting. I did read that. Hmm. But almost all of these chapters, I think, are have a lot to uh, play around with. So if we're ever in any doubt about what to do, I think we could always grab this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I'd love to do another chapter. The one on yeah. genius, I think, would be a lot of fun. It's a sort of set up for Aurobindo. I, I, I would love to talk about genius as well and collective genius. That's, yeah. That's a term you brought up, Lisa. And uh, there's been some thinking and even research into, into this and people that have looked at um, really how do groups become creative, like become meta-creative? Like how do they accomplish things that could never have been accomplished by one person alone? And oh, yeah, like um, how they, um, they did a crowdsourcing to figure out some very complicated protein structure. You know, when they calculated how much uh, computing time it would take, it would take, you know, like years of computers working 24-7. And so they would put it out as a game on the internet for people to come and, you know, work together on figuring out this particular protein structure. And I think it only took them like three days. (laughs) (laughs) That's great. That's fascinating. Yeah, yeah. And there might and uh, the, the quantum, the quantum per level, or that may have something. Quantum logic may have something to do with it as well, because you know when you get a dis, when you when you're able to work with a more complex logic system that's distributed rather than like following linear processes, uh, you're able to go through many more calculations much more quickly. So, uh, like just speaking earlier about the both and the, the neither nor the and then the either or the or both either or and not and neither nor uh i think that that gets to happen when multiple per, you know multiple perspectives are in a, a perspectival space if that makes sense so uh anyway we can come back to this the 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 the, the it, well, maybe we can work on this, work on the chapter on genius and, and fill in some of these um, possibilities of what, what that could look like as a group. Um, I'm just reading German idealism um, and looking at Goethe, Novalis, and um, Schiller, and Schelling, and Fichte, and all these guys. And there was, and Clara, um, who married two or three of them, I think, and divorced them. <laughs> <laughs> heard another one <laughs> this this Gina circle and um they you know none of them probably would have been anything at all if they hadn't had that group to uh hang out with and talk about this stuff so i'm very fascinated how groups you know that that group uh dynamic can uh, create conditions for what we call genius um so and i believe that's very encouraging what that anecdote you just shared, Lisa, that if we put our, if we have a desired outcome and we just put it out there and then relax a little bit, who knows what could come through with all of the research 
that's accessible to us now. Yeah, that sounds like a great idea. So we're going to skip next week, then we'll all take a vacation and then come back on um, on uh, the following Tuesday. Sounds better to me. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm a bit read out, so got so yeah. many things going on. A little bit of a break wouldn't hurt. Spring break. Spring break. <laughs> yeah. <Yes. laughs> okay. Works for me. Yeah. And uh, Lisa, thanks for coming back. Yes. Too. Yeah. And it's really wonderful to have your, your voice in the mix. And, oh, my pleasure. Yeah. yeah and, 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 you know, we've all been sort of dripping and sharing the things that we're working on and aspirations we have or whatnot, uh, from Jeffrey's novel to John's pieces, Ed hinted things, I'm working on things. And, you know, like, I, I want these conversations to be part of a milieu, part of sort of the generative matrix, the generative kind of... Uh, uh, Senius container, or it's not even a container. It's sort of a, unless it's a Klein container, but it's really like what informs that that creative process. And so, uh, you know, what if you're working on something, or you would like feedback on ideas that you're working through, or creative type work? Really, I want to invite you to share that, uh, and I'm pretty sure you'll you'll get some helpful response. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're doing these, we have the forum space and it's sort of yeah. evolving. It's open to ideas, open to, to possibilities. You have a new essay coming up, right? Lisa? You um, work, are you working on something? Yeah, I'm working on turning my talk in New York into um, a full-blown published piece cool yeah it's it's turning out to be more work than i anticipated because i i was able to presume a lot of knowledge in the group and now i'm having to go back and fill in a lot of gaps and provide a lot of context that i didn't have to do or didn't actually have time to do in the half hour they gave me cool that transforming language to transform the world is that the overall theme of that uh no this is the one that um uses gabeser to understand the thunder perfect mind and vice oh, yeah. versa oh yeah 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 okay yeah that's another an project yeah. <laughs> all righty thank you thanks okay, thanks all. everyone Nice seeing you again. See you next time. Two weeks. Bye-bye. Bye.